Ruth Reichel is a James Beard award-winning food writer and former New York Times food critic and is my guest as part of the Creative Life A Conversation series. In her most recent book, Save Me the Plums, My Gourmet Memoir, trailblazing food writer and beloved restaurant critic Ruth Reichel chronicles her groundbreaking tenure as editor-in-chief of Gourmet from 1999 to 2009. Ruth Reichel began writing about food in 1972 when she published Mmm, a Feastiary. Since then, she is author of the critically acclaimed best-selling memoirs Tender at the Bone, Comfort Me with Apples, Garlic and Sapphires, and For You, Mom, Finally, before taking on the editor-in-chief position at Gourmet, she was the restaurant critic for the New York Times, served as the food editor and restaurant critic for the Los Angeles Times. She has been honored with six James Beard Awards for her journalism, magazine feature writing, and criticism. Will you please join me in welcoming Ruth Reichel. I'm, I'm just going to, uh, I'm not going to get too close to you, honest, I'm just going to get that, there you go. Is that good, Sarah? Thank you. All right. I have not been in a room with this many people in two years. <laughs> and and we sort of like it, right? But like, like, like you, you. No, I like it. Yeah, no, I it's really great. Like no, it's it. nothing against you all. It's just, it does, it's a little weird. Uh, no, I... I love, boy, I have missed people. I have, I have missed crowds. I have missed being around strangers. I can understand that. <laughs> yeah. What has, has the lockdown, I mean, it obviously it's impacted everybody. How did it impact you and your, for want of a better term, your creative life? Uh, well, I am someone who is used to being very, very busy. I'm yeah. used to traveling a lot. Um, and the notion that I was going to have to stay home was terrifying, actually. Um, and so I sort of thought, okay, what am I going to, what if this thing goes on for a long time? Remember how in the beginning we only thought it was going to be a couple of months and then we'd all be back to normal? But there was a piece of me, we were in LA and we came rushing home because it was like, oh my God. What if they close the airports? We better get home. And I came home and saw empty shelves in the supermarket for the first time in my life. And it hit me that I didn't know where, the, where we were going to end up, but that food in America was never going to be the same after this. That um, maybe it was going to be the triumph of processed food, or maybe everybody was going to go start cooking, which remember Americans didn't cook for a right. long time, and that it would be this you know great moment that people like me hope for. And I thought I should be keeping a record of this just for posterity, right? I'm I'm going to start calling people, and so I started calling farmers, fishermen, chefs ranchers, policy people in Washington, just talking about what the effects of COVID were. And um, then a, a filmmaker in LA heard that I was doing this and said, you know, we should be doing a movie together. Um, so I spent COVID working on a movie for the first time in my life, um, discovering Zoom, which is a, it's an amazing tool because what happened over the course of 18 months as I was talking to people on, on a weekly basis, people who I'd never met, we developed this, these real close relationships. Um, you know, a rancher in Kansas, uh, a farmer in Nebraska, um, a policy guy um, who had been Gillibrand's um, agriculture person. Mm. I mean, suddenly these are, they become friends and it, there's no medium like Zoom. Um, and this filmmaker who had thought that this was just going to be preliminary, that these weren't going to be um, real parts. I mean, she had sort of envisioned that when it was over, we would go and I would meet these people. 
and I did at the end a little bit, but what we discovered was that Zoom is all by itself a creative medium that um, is remarkable. And, you know, people, one, actually not one people, four separate people that I spoke to said, you know, you've become like my shrink. <laughs> You know, they're locked up too, sure. and they can't, they don't really want to complain to the one person they're locked up. So I became the sounding board for people. People cried, um, I, you know, and there were so many ups and downs. Um, you know, restaurants opened, restaurants closed. Um, farmers thought they were going to do one thing and ended up having to do another. And um, so I was learning a new medium, a new language, which was. Um, incredible and very absorbing. The information that you obtained from from those interviews and from talking to people, oh by the way, you're doing this during an election year too. It's not only a global pandemic, Absolutely. but it's an election year and the people you are talking to are not only impacted by what's happening in the health world, in the political world as well. Yes, and it was for me a serious political <clears throat> awakening because I have been the person who, for the 50 years that I've been writing about food, have said, has said to people, you know, the great thing about food is that you can have a real impact. Um, we vote with our dollars. If you don't like something, you know, you, can, you don't buy it. You can convince your friends not to buy it. And what I learned in the course of really studying the food system, and I really, I mean, I, my husband says I went to graduate school in food <laughs> <laughs> during COVID, um, was that that's nonsense. Um, it's political. And, you know, much as you may want to vote with your dollars, it's the government that drives food policy. And if you want to make real changes in the food system, you have to do it by voting. Um, you know, this notion that by going to farmers markets we're going to change the world, we're not. Um, that cheap, abundant food has been a political drive. You know, at the end of World War II, the American government decided that the best way to fight communism would be to have the cheapest food in the world and the most abundant. And everything that has happened since then has been driven by that. It's when we started you know, using antibiotics on healthy animals to make them grow faster. It was to make meat cheaper. Um, it has had enormous consequences on our health. Um, and if we want to change that, we can't just you know, look to the wonderful farmers we're surrounded by here in this part of the world who are doing their part, we really need to do it on a much larger level. We need to insist that there are local food sheds. I mean, the, the distribution problems have been intense. Um, anyway, um, yes, the politics really mattered. And you know, a lot of people, I, I talked to people across the political um, divide. And for both, for both sides, for want of a better term, if, if whatever the political affiliation is, they're both severely impacted by it, and I assume often negatively impacted by it. Yes, and, um, and often are not voting their interest, but um, their, their hearts in, in ways that, um, you know, I mean, what's, what's happened, what American food policy has done is essentially hollow out rural America. Um, and that has had enormous political consequences and people are just starting to realize it. I mean, as this wonderful rancher, who, I mean, I, I've, I've never met this man, but I'm a little bit in love with him. Um, and we've had a these... therapist should not have <laughs> any sort of relationship with him. No, he is not one of the people oh, who okay. right. um, says, but he, he's just, I mean, he's just this great American guy. He looks like the Marlboro cowboy, you know, yeah. with his hat, and he's out there riding the range, and, you know, in February, uh, he said it's calf killing weather. And, and he was out on his horse rescuing 
these abandoned calves in, in these horrible storms. Um, but, you know, he said, you know, the one thing we have here in Kansas is our kids get us, they still get a really good education. And then they go away to college and they don't come home because there's nothing for them here. And so we are now surrounded by, you know, our kids don't come back. And so we're surrounded by people who don't look like us. And most of us don't like it. Hmm. When you think about the the impact of of where we are, I mean, we don't we don't know where we're where we are yet, right? We don't know how this is going to end. We're we're sort of living through this. We're still having supply issues. We're still we're seeing the restaurant business be changed before our eyes. Yes, although there you know, was a moment when I really thought, oh what's going to happen for restaurants will be great, you know, the kind of abuse won't happen, the whole model will change because it's revealed what a terrible business model restaurants are. But you know what happened was um, at the end when they all opened up again, they went right back to the same model. Even the people who said they weren't going to did. And you know, I mean sadly I think even though we have seen what the supply chain issues are. We have seen what the concentration of meat packing plants has meant to the availability of meat. Um, I think that the will to change it isn't there. I mean, um, I, I was much more optimistic in the middle of COVID thinking how much things would change. And now I feel like um, it's still very hard to see where we're going to end up. So, how would you articulate briefly what the model is? Of, of what's wrong with that restaurant model? Well, it's basically what's wrong with the entire American food system, which is that it, will, it runs on the backs of undocumented workers who are exploited. I mean, the, the whole model of American food um, is based on a kind of exploitation. Um, and, you know, I mean, what happens in restaurants is that the people in the back um, are not paid as well as the people in the front. And um, that's a problem because they're really the ones who are making the product that is bringing you into the restaurant. But, um, you know, I mean, we really need to, um, I don't, I could go on about this forever, and I'm not sure it's um, where we want to go with this discussion. Right. But, but it's, a, but it's a, obviously it's something, and here, here is where I will uh, insert and ask this question, which is, uh, to bring it back around a little bit, which is, when you started out writing about food, how much you, you learned about that model? You didn't go in understanding that. You learned that over time. Uh, I did, although I have to say, you know, I worked my way through college as a waitress. So you had a pretty good idea. I had a pretty good idea of what went on in restaurants and, um, you know, how abusive it was to women and to people of color. I mean, I. I I was pretty aware of that. And um, how much did that insert itself into what you were writing about? Not as much as it probably should have. Um, you know, I have to say, when I started writing restaurant reviews, I mean, I didn't get this job and think, oh, this is going to be my career. I mean, when, some, when an editor asked me if I wanted to write restaurant reviews, my thought was, free food. I mean, <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, I was, I was basically, I was living in a commune in Berkeley with my husband. We had no money. We certainly couldn't go out to eat. So the idea that I was going to go to fancy restaurants on somebody else's dime and get to take my friends was incredibly exciting. So at that point, I was not thinking about, you know, oh, this is 
this is a bad business model. I was thinking how excited I was to be in these restaurants. And you were hired to do that because of the writing, because of the skill you had as a writer more than the knowledge of, of food. Um, well, kind of. I mean, I was working, I, I had started a little collective restaurant. People say, you know, I'm a chef. I, I, we were a bunch of people who loved to cook who started a kind of hippie restaurant. Um, so I'm not a chef. But um, one of, I, I was doing some freelance writing for uh, New West Magazine, which was a sister publication of New York Magazine, which had just started in San Francisco. And I was writing little service articles. And um, one of my editors ate dinner in my restaurant many nights. And one night he just looked at me and he said, you know, you're a much better writer than our restaurant critic. <laughs> and you can cook. Have you ever thought about writing restaurant reviews? But what they did was they already had a restaurant critic. So they said, we'd like you to try out for the job. So we'll pay you to go to a restaurant and um, we'll see how it is. So I turned that one in. And they said, this is really good, but we want you to write one more before we fire our critic. <laughs> and so they sent me to um, a restaurant called Robert, which was a very fancy little French restaurant. And so here we are, you know, my commune friends and I, we, we go into this restaurant. And all, all of my friends really want me to have this job, so they're all trying to be very helpful. And I suddenly have this vision that we are a band who have been sent by a rival restaurateur to find problems with the restaurant. And I go home and that night in a blaze of inspiration, I sit down and I write not a conventional restaurant review, but a short story. And the, the food is woven through it. But it's really a short story. And I called it, it, it begins, the names have all been changed to protect the innocent. <laughs> and I give us, you know, fingers, the mouth. And it's, it's a story. And I called it Cops and Robert. And Cute. I look at it and I think, you know, this is really chancy. Um, nobody's ever seen a restaurant review that looked like this, but restaurant reviews are boring. And if I'm going to do this, I do not want to write pieces that say this had too much salt, and I don't want to write consumer report pieces. They're boring. And if I'm going to get this job, I want to have some fun with it. And I turned it in and went back, drove home, and on the way home it suddenly hit me that I was an idiot. That, that, you know, that I had just blown this job and I saw the free meals vanishing and none of my friends were going to speak to me. <laughs> but when my editor called me, he said, this is fantastic. And remember, this is new journalism. This is, right. you know, mid-70s. And he said, American restaurants are growing and changing and the writing about them should grow and change too. And the reason I talk about this is that I think that one of the big points of creativity is taking chances. Um, I, I mean, I have realized in my life that it's the things that scare me the most that are the things that are worth doing. I mean, it's like, I mean, in, in Save Me the Plums, I talk about the David Foster Wallace piece right. for Gourmet Magazine, which terrified me. I mean, I was absolutely convinced that I was going to get fired for running that piece. But I knew I had to do it. And, um, you know, I mean, I, he says in the piece, he says, you know, I'm absolutely sure that the readers of Gourmet Magazine do not want to read about the ethics of eating living and sentient beings in their culinary publication. And I thought, yeah, they don't. 
but it was it was an important piece, and um, I you know I the night it went to press, I was so nervous I couldn't sleep, and um, my son and I were talking, and he said, you know, mom, I think you're underestimating your readers. I think cooks want to think about these things. I think mm -hmm. they want to know them. And he was right. He was 14, but he was right. I mean, I thought, you know, we had a million subscribers. I thought two thirds of them were going to cancel their subscriptions. In fact, two canceled their subscriptions. And hundreds of people wrote in and said, we so appreciate a magazine that gives us this kind of writing and takes on these subjects. So in some way, I mean, maybe not even in some way, in, in large part, that seems to be what you're doing now. Yeah, I have always believed that the secret to long life and secret to being alive is to do things you don't know how to do, to constantly take on new things. I mean, if you spend your whole life just doing the same old thing, it's not very interesting. When you were regularly writing restaurant reviews for the New York Times, did, did that get to be a Groundhog Day experience? Or was it, were you always testing yourself to say, OK, this, I can change this, because the industry itself has changed? Um, you know, I, I loved that job. Um, and at the time, I mean, it was such a long time ago. I mean, it's hard to remember how different food was in the 90s and how much there was to explore. And I, you know, I've always believed that one of the great things about what a newspaper food section can do is that they can show, they can reveal the city to the readers in a way that no other section can. So, I mean, there was a lot for me of you know, going out to Flushing and talking about restaurants that um, the former uh, critics had relegated to, you know, the $25 and under column. And, you know, to say to people, you know, Flushing is amazing. It's like you, you, you can go to Hong Kong without leaving New York. Um, and, you know, trying to explore um, other parts of the city that had not been considered the territory of the lead restaurant critic. So it didn't become Groundhog Day. It was like a constant learning experience. Was it, what kind of, I know, I know you've written about this and we've talked about it, but what was the, uh, the rules that you had or, or the input that you had from your editors at the, at the time, at times, I mean, how much because you had quite a bit of freedom. Not, yes, I mean, it, it is amazing, but I, I don't know what it's like there now, but when I was at the New York Times, they let their critics do whatever they did. I mean, I, I thought they were going to give me some kind of advice. You should, do, you should do this kind of restaurant or that kind of restaurant, or wouldn't it be great if you reviewed X restaurant, which hasn't been reviewed? Nothing, nothing. Um, you, are, you are left alone, and in fact, they were also extremely kind to me because it turned out that my predecessor was running this campaign to get rid of me. Um, and um, when Page Six heard about it two years later and called me up and said, you know, he's been writing these letters saying that you're you know, destroying the reputation of the paper by writing about you know, Japanese noodle shops. Um, and I went to my boss and said, is this true? And he said, yes, but we didn't think you needed to know about it. You were new, and it seemed like you were doing fine, and we didn't, we didn't want to you know, make you worry about it. Hmm. I think that's good. Oh, I thought it was amazing. Yeah, no, it's yeah. amazing. It's a very nice gesture. Yeah. But then sometimes you, you think you want to know, too, right? I'm, I was, you know, two years later, I was glad I knew, but if they had told me that in yeah. my first few months, I would have been devastated. You would and, have, and it, would I would have, have been shaken. Yeah. I would have been shaken. I yeah. mean, I, I think it was a good call.
And uh, so I, I, I'm hearing a theme, and you didn't completely finish that thought, but you've, you've bounced a lot of people out of their jobs. <laughs> <laughs> no, I did not bounce Brian out of his job. He quit. But the thing about Brian was he, you know, when you are the restaurant critic of the New York Times, you have so much power that it is easy if you do not happen to be married to a man like I am who constantly reminds you that you're an idiot. Um, <laughs> <Aww>. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but it's easy to start thinking that it's you and not the institution. And Brian left the job because, you know, he thought that um, the Times was holding him back. When you talk about the power of that job, and, and I guess just of, of any critic, but I mean, the New York Times film critic, the New York Times theater critic, the New York Times restaurant critic, are all those positions, first of all, are they as powerful now as they were when you were there? Um, I don't think any newspaper is as powerful as it was then. Yep. Um, but I think they're still pretty powerful. I mean, I will tell you a story about how I discovered how powerful the New York Times was. My first day at the job, my phone rings and I pick up the phone and there's this voice I have not heard in 20 years. It says, Ruth? And I said, yes. And he said, my friend Mohammed calling me from Morocco. He said, I, w I was on the plane to do the Hajj and I read that you had become the restaurant critic of the New York Times. And I thought, okay, Muhammad in Mecca is reading <laughs> that wow. I am the restaurant critic of the New York Times. I mean, that is pretty amazing. Is, is it ever daunting or? It's scary, yeah. it's very scary. Um, it's, um, you know, people get fired because of things you've written. Um, it's it, people. It, it's it's not a comfortable power. At least it wasn't for me. What do you think the role of criticism is in our society? I mean, is it is it fair? Is it is it good? Does it help us? Um, well, it dep You know, here's there's criticism and criticism. In criticism of the consumer reports kind, right. um, of the Yelp kind, yeah. is useless, in my opinion. What good criticism does, whether it's film, book, restaurant, theater, art, it gives the reader better tools to appreciate the experience. I mean, when you read a good review of anything, you should come away better equipped to experience that movie, that play, that piece of art, that restaurant. It, and there are a lot of ways to do it. You can put it in context. You can um, you know, make people see things they wouldn't see, taste things they wouldn't taste. I mean, in terms of food, I hoped often to introduce people to new cuisines um, in a serious way, to tell them how to evaluate, how to think about Thai food, for instance, or Salvadoran food. Um, and I think it has real value done well. Do you feel that way when your books are reviewed? <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, let me see what they're writing about Save Me the Plums. Uh, well, you know, I have to say that my novel, Delicious, got the most savage review I have ever read in the New York Times. Um, and um, it, I, I, it, it made me cringe every time I thought about it for about two months. But, you know, I just said to myself, look, um, you know, you dished it out, you better be able to take it. Yeah. I, um, Is it when you decided that you wanted to write a novel was that again that's that's something that you that you say okay this is i'm going to tell i'm going to tell a story i've spent most of my life telling stories but i'm going to tell one that i that has come from here 
uh, yeah, I mean, I had always said if I didn't have a day job, I would try and write a novel because I love novels. I mean, yeah. they, they are my greatest love, really. I mean, I, I, um, and um, I didn't know if I could do it. And um, it was hard. <laughs> I have to say, the first one was really hard. The one I'm working on now has not been nearly as hard. Oh, that's great. And that'll be out when you're done. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I'm very close to done, I that's hope. That's wonderful. I hope. I haven't, my editor hasn't seen it yet, so we'll see. But. So I want to go to audience questions, but I, I do, of course, want to spend some time on Gourmet Magazine uh, because you were so, so much a part of that uh, institution. and. Uh, you write about it in the in the latest book. I, I um, in talking to you over the years, it just seems like that was the dream gig for you. It was. Um, you know, if you care about food, which I do, the idea that you would take over this Bible and that you could actually have an impact on the national conversation about food was a dream. Magazine making is the most collaborative work in the world. You know, I mean, it is, it is many people and it changes, the, each issue changes and grows as everybody puts their stamp on it. And I reveled in that kind of collaboration. I mean, I just, I remember, you know, every issue, we, I mean, we would start an issue about a year ahead of time. And, you know, I remember going, you know, the first meeting, we would all gather and everybody would throw out their ideas. And I would think, I can't wait to see what this issue is going to be like when it's done. Um, and there's just such excitement in shaping it, watching it change. You know, you, you, you think of an idea for a story and you think of a writer for it, then you wait to see what that person is going to actually produce. You can never really know. Um, and you know, I, it was a dream because one, they basically let me do what I wanted. I had the most wonderful group of people to work with. Um, and. Condé Nast had all the money in the world in those days. So, you know, I mean, people keep saying to me, you know, wouldn't you like to edit a magazine again? And I think, that ship sailed. I will never, nobody will ever have the kind of opportunity that we had in those days. I mean, it was the golden days of publishing. And, um, you know, Cy Newhouse, who ran Condé Nast, was a very strange man. But I think he was the last person in America who genuinely believed that if you gave people an excellent product, they would be willing to pay for it. And he just said, you know, get, get the best people. I, I want a great product. So why did it, why did it go then? Well, everything changed. Uh, the internet came along. Um, they, you know, they didn't have the kind of money they used to have. Um, advertising started going south um, across the board. I mean, publishing has changed really dramatically in the last 15 years, and this was just the beginning of it. And you know, Condé Nast had two food magazines, and one of them had to go, and. Um, I will never understand why it was us, but... Um. I, I was thinking of this earlier today, that, that if, if there was a plus to that, and, and I only say that, uh, and you may, <laughs> you may violently disagree with me on this point, but it, it, I see some of my favorite magazines now, and I, they seem to be limping along and they, they've been gutted, and the writing isn't very good, and, and they used to be fantastic. I used to look forward to them to arrive, and they're, they're just there, and they're, they're not what they used to be. And if anything is a plus, is that you went out on a high. I, I often feel that way. Um, 
although not a high, because the last year was not great, actually. Yeah. We were already seeing um, what it means when you, know, you plan every issue. And the publisher comes in and says, you know, we're going to have 100 pages of ads. So you, there's a ratio, right? So you plan for that. And then uh, you get closer to publication, and she says, well, you know what? We've only got 50 pages of ads. And uh, you have to take out editorial. But it's never the editorial you want to take out that you have to take out, because what you have to leave in is what they've sold advertising against, which are never the pieces you most care about. I mean, they don't sell advertising against David Foster Wallace. They sell it against a piece about, um, you know, 10 great hotels in Mexico. Right. Um, and so what you end up with is, it's not like someone has said to you, you can't run these pieces. But essentially, the economics are dictating you can't run those pieces. And so, I mean, I feel like in the last year, I saw where it was going, and I do feel like I dodged a bullet. I mean, I would have had to, you know, lay off half my staff, which would have been agonizing. And I don't think we would have ever had the great magazine that we had in the past. Do you feel that what is being written now in whatever platform it is, it in some way replaces it in the sense of that we have the, the readers of Gourmet have a place to go or have places to go where they can still read that type and that quality. Absolutely. I mean, I think that food writing has never been better than it is right now. And part of it is, like, you don't have to look at a Gourmet. You, you can see it across the board. I mean, food writing, which used to be segregated right. into, you know, a, a few magazines is now you know, the New Yorker runs great stuff, Harper's runs great stuff. I mean, it, it's, you, you see, you know, newspapers are running really important pieces, which, you know, in, in 2006, I gave a speech to the Newspaper Editorial Writers Conference, where I begged them to pay attention to food, because not one of them had ever written an editorial about food. And I you know, laid out what was going on, you know, the devastation of the o oceans, and on and on and on. I mean, all the problems. In, and so many people asked for that speech that I had, to, I, I had it printed and just we <laughs> sent it out to people about all the things that there were serious issues that there were to write. Well, you know, five years later, you couldn't have written, you, you couldn't have given that speech because they did start covering food. And you know, suddenly Mark Bittman is like, you know, on the opinion pages of the New York Times, and his brief is writing about food issues. I mean, things changed dramatically, and um, there are more and better food writers today than there have ever been before. I want to open this up to our audience, and um, I, I, I do. I do want to ask you, though, is when you think of a new project, you've, you've worked now on television, you're doing this documentary, you're working on a novel, do, does it, um, do you see it always being somewhat based on food because that is a, a great love and interest? It, but it's also your brand. It, well, it's not about the brand. I mean, I just, I really do see the world food forward. I mean, it is, I mean, since I was a little kid, I have, I have sort of seen the world through the lens of food. And I think um, it's, it's just how I think. I mean, I think there's nothing you couldn't teach people through food, mm. you know, history, anthropology, whatever. I, and it's also, I have been, really fortunate to live through the big food revolution in America. You know, I've been, I've been writing about food for 50 years. And when I started writing about food, nobody cared. And today, everybody cares about food. Um, 
And so I've got this knowledge that's, you know, hardwired in me just because I've been there. I mean, in the 80s, a chef said to me, you know, you're like the zealot of food. Every time I look up, <laughs> there you are with a, you know, your pad in your hand taking notes. And, um, you know, I mean, part of it is just, you know, being as old as I am, um, I, I have witnessed um, this remarkable moment in American food. And, um, you know, if somebody asks me a question, I can just sort of like pull it out. Oh yeah, you know, Julia Child said this, you know, Mary Frances Fisher said that. I mean, I... When you go on Instagram and you see if somebody has taken a picture of their tiramisu, do you say, oh, that's cool? <laughs> I do. Yeah. <laughs> because I have an Instagram account and I am also, actually, I took a picture of the most amazing tiramisu you've ever seen of just a few weeks ago. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking our Creative Life guest, Ruth Rachel. Right. Let's. Uh, I'd love to open this up to uh, our audience, our wonderful audience. You st by the way, you still look great. Um, let's go to some. Yes. <laughs> I was going to say. Let's go. Let's go to the woman in the blue mask. <laughs> uh, Joe, I always love your interviews. Thank you. Ruth, um, when I realized that the virus was going to go on longer than two months, I sat down and said, what the hell am I going to do with my time? And I realized somehow I'd spent 50 years not cooking and somebody feeding me, I don't know who they were. And your wonderful books and the new Dishing with Julia were my guides. And I now can whip off some amazing things. So thank you so much. I love your writing. Oh, thank you. Thank you. That's great. Raise your hand, we'll give you the microphone here. Thank you, Kim. What was your favorite book and why? What was my favorite oh, book? Oh, that's a good Whoa. Oh, that you wrote that, that you wrote. Oh, that, oh, that I you wrote. wrote. Um I I really like Tender at the Bone. Um, yeah. I, We're supposed to cry all through that, right? <laughs> 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 and I, and I'll tell you one one reason why is um, you know, I, I really struggled with writing about my, my mother being bipolar and um, I got so many letters afterwards from young people who said they had bipolar parents and that it had been really helpful to them to know that you could survive it. So it felt like, um, you know, that book just, you know, had a life out there. And I, I also, I mean, I, I really like For You, Mom, Finally, which didn't get the chance it should have gotten because I've been on book tour for all of my books, and that book, I broke my foot on my first day of book tour. So it, it never really, um, and also my editor insisted that I call it Not Becoming My Mother and they brought it out on Mother's Day as a great Mother's Day present. <laughs> and, you know, had I been on book tour, I would have said, no, no, really, this is, this is an homage to my mother. It's not, it's not a mean piece of, and um, it, it was an unfortunate title, I think. Other questions over here? Go. Thanks. I have a creative process question. You do so many different kinds of writing, all of them well. I've read them all. Um, how do you switch gears mentally among them and perhaps physically as well? I don't see it. I mean, I don't switch gears. I, I, it's all the same to me, really. Um, you know, you just sit down and write. I mean, the hardest thing about writing is writing, you know, just sitting down and doing it. Um, I mean, oddly, um, I found it easier to write when I had a day job, and I got up at four every morning and wrote before I got the guys up and started the day. Um, it's much harder when the whole day is stretching before you, and um, I, I, so I mean, for me, the hardest thing is just making myself sit down and do it. 
Was writing when you had uh, when you had a deadline was that was that helpful for you? Very helpful. Yeah. Very helpful. I mean, I am definitely a deadline writer. You know, if you tell me it's due on the 14th, I will get it to you on the 14th, but I probably won't start it until the 13th. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll go. Uh, well, let's go here. That way, Kim doesn't have to go. Yeah. <laughs> Poor Kim, we're going to run her in. Hello. Hello. Um, what sparks your creativity? Uh, fear, mostly. <laughs> fear of what? Um, fear of um, not uh, living my life as fully as I should. You know, I mean, I, 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 you know, I really have this sense that, you know, we are so privilege to be here on this earth and um, you just need to use your time the best you possibly can and I can't do a lot of things very well but you know I can cook and I can write that's about all I can do so <laughs> that's a good <laughs> done well with that yes uh, Kim you're right there go ahead Hi Ruth, I hope you're doing well tonight. Uh, my question is, what was your favorite restaurant uh, that you ever been to? And did you discover that restaurant while you're uh, reviewing food? Also, you look absolutely stunning tonight. <laughs> <laughs> by, by the way, that's one of my students. <laughs> They just made me very proud. Go ahead. <laughs> Thank you. Um, well, oddly, my favorite restaurant I ever went to was one that pretty much changed my life, and it was way before I started writing restaurant reviews. Um, it was a... I was on my honeymoon uh, with my first husband, and we were staying with a professor of ours who had moved to Crete. And he um, took us up a mountain one day. He said, you know, we, we're going to walk up this mountain. And we got to this little house, really. And there was this huge pile of onions, almost as big as the house, next to the house. And we sat on this veranda. And the woman came, and she poured oil that she had pressed from her own grapes into a bowl and she went off and snipped some herbs from the hillside and put them in the oil. And she sliced some onions and some tomatoes that she had grown and she gave us a loaf of bread and she said, now I'm going fishing. <laughs> and she came back and she lit a fire of grape branches and she grilled a fish and we, for dessert, we had yogurt from her sheep, her own sheep, and some apricots from the tree there. And it was the most extraordinary meal. And I realized that I could make exactly that meal back in New York, but that it wouldn't be the same. That it was about the place that we were and the fact that the ingredients had all come from there and that they were all really fresh. And it completely changed the way I thought about food forever after. I mean, I, I, and this was in 1970, and it, for me it was the discovery of, you know, seasonal, local, um, this is the, the perfect food for this place. And it wouldn't be perfect any place else. And, you know, to get that from one meal is pretty amazing. And no other meal I've ever had in a restaurant has come close to that kind of revelation. That's beautiful. Yeah. Let's see, we have here, there. Where do you want to go, Kim? Yeah. Uh, well, let's go, we'll go, uh, we'll go right there. And then we'll work our way back. Thanks, hi Ruth. Uh, so, is there a story that you look back on and think, "Damn, I wish I wrote that one"? Oh, oh so many. 
so many. I mean, I, I can tell you recently a story. I mean, Gabriel Hamilton's piece about Prune and the closing of Prune, it was about a year ago. Yeah. I mean, it was like, I looked at that and thought, damn, I wish I wrote that story. Uh, it, it was incredible. Um, I mean, I come upon stories I wish I had written at least twice a day. <laughs> do, you, do you have, if, if you were to have come across a story and say, oh, I want to write about this, do you have an outlet for it? Yeah, I mean. If you wanted it. Yeah, yeah, yeah I mean, yes. Yeah, well, that's, that's fun. Um, or let somebody else do it, too. That's um, also fun. I mean, actually, I, I'm about to start, just, just for a month, but I'm about to start writing a substack. Uh, they have a writer in residence program. And uh, so f for the month of December, I'm going to be, ha have an outlet for all my, oh, that's for great. All my writing. Very nice. Uh, anyone else in this quadrant? <laughs> <laughs> so they're in the aisle, Kim, and then we got two or three up there. Hi, Ruth. So my question was, do you ever feel like your reviews ever end up sounding the same, or how do you prevent that from happening? For feel what? That you write end up sounding the same, or right. how do you, you prevent that from happening? The same, yeah. um, well, you know, I think that's called having a voice, and mm. it's a good thing. And I, I, I think my big lesson on that was when I was on tour for my kitchen year. The woman who interviewed me in Seattle got a copy of my first cookbook, which I wrote when I was 22. And she started reading passages from M mm and passages from my kitchen year, and they were written 50 years apart. And it, it, it blew me away because I did not realize how I sounded the same. I mean, um, and um, you know, she kept saying what a great thing it was, and I thought, God, I didn't, I didn't grow up at all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know if I would have liked that little experiment. Uh, but you know, there I was, the same person. Uh, but I think you're right. It's a voice. It's it, it, it's it's you. It it it's me. It, it's just how I sound, and I don't think I can sound any different. All right, next up, there we go. Hi, so I saw that you've been awarded with six James Beard Awards, and um, I was wondering if there was anyone speci uh, specific you like dedicated any of those to, and if so, why? If, if there's any specific I've dedicated? Meaning that you, you feel that are responsible for those. Um, oh, for, for getting those? Yeah. Um, I don't know, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not a big believer in awards. Um, you know, you think that they're not political, they are. I mean, um, I, I think lots of great writers don't ever get awards. Lots of mediocre writers get them a lot. Um, oh, like who? <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, you know, I, I, but it's nice. It's nice to be in that company, right? It, it, it is nice to be in in that company. Um, but you know, I mean, the truth is, we used to call the restaurant criticism award the Alan Richman Award because Alan Richman won it, I think, eleven times. <laughs> Does anybody even remember Alan Richman's writing? <laughs> No. <laughs> but you sound a little bitter about it. <laughs> no, I mean, it was just funny, you know, but... but he was, yeah. Um, and, you know, I mean, here's another thing about awards. So the first year I was the editor of Gourmet, um, we had never won, you know, the important award um, are the magazine awards. Uh, the Ellie's and Gourmet had never won one of those. And what they, was the award? The Ellie's. Yeah. Oh, okay. They're, they're the magazine awards, right. and they're 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 like the Oscars of okay. the magazine world. And what you get is this beautiful 
sort of Calder elephant sculpture. Oh. Um, and um, it mattered a lot to Cy Newhouse that you won those. And Gourmet had never won. So it was like very important for us, you know, as this new incarnation of the magazine to win an Ellie, which we did. And the first year, we literally swept the James Beard Journalism Awards. I think we won eight out of 10. Um, and there was no magic about that. They were expensive to enter. Um, we spent a fortune doing it. Gourmet didn't care how much, I mean, Condé Nast didn't care how much you spent to enter right. these things. And we had a task force. I mean, every newspaper, every big newspaper, I mean, the New York Times has a full-time task force whose job it is to get the Pulitzers ready. I mean, I could show you when they submitted for me. I mean, it, it's, they gave it to me when I left. And, um, you know, and so um, wealthy institutions can do that, can spend thousands and thousands of dollars entering these awards. And um, less wealthy institutions can't. So there's a reason why the big publications uh, win these things. Uh, I'm sorry, I mean, I, I don't mean to be bitter about it, but I think, you know, to think that they're really um, an indication of true excellence, I think, is hard. So two things. One is, and, and yet for, for you, for me, for most people, that are putting out any kind of biography, it's the first thing that they, they include, you know, is how many awards you've won, which is, you know, I don't know what you're supposed to do with it, but there you go. Right. Um, it's, it, it gives you some sort of plus. Um, but the other part of that is, so then what does, where, where do you get your, not award, but reward, in the sense of, that, that is the satisfaction of saying, okay, this is, this is what I'm doing this for. Um, you know, ha having people say that it has mattered to them, that, that the work has mattered to them, that's what I'm doing it for. Yeah. Um, and um, I, I mean, I'm, I also make a living at it. I mean, that's the other thing right. I do it for. But, but don't, I mean, don't you think, <laughs> when you look at something, when you look at it and you say, wow, I, I'm proud of this, that it doesn't get much better than that. Um, it, it takes me a long time to get distant enough from something, <laughs> something to feel like I'm really proud of it. I mean, honestly, um, it, it, takes, it takes a while for me. You know, I mean, I, I became rather close to Mary Frances Fisher. Yep. And she said, you know, she couldn't, she couldn't read her work, that it made her physically ill. And I thought that was apocryphal. but. Um, her editor, Judith Jones, told me it was true, that it, it made her physically ill to read her own stuff. Um, I doesn't, I mean, I don't feel that way, but um, it, I don't really look at something and say, oh, this is really good. You know, I mean, there are, there are writers who, when something gets rejected, send it out immediately to other places. If I get something rejected, I go, oh, this was really terrible, and I put it in a drawer. <laughs> <laughs> and I guess, and you're talking more long-term, and I guess I mean for the short-term, as you're looking at it, and you think, okay, this is, this is done. Like, I've done what I can do with it. I, I feel good about this. Um, I will tell you what feels good to me about writing. Um, I mean, I hate writing, but I love having written. Yeah. And there is this thing that happens on your best days when you go away. When you sit down and you're, I don't know what I'm gonna do, I don't know what I'm gonna do, I don't know what I'm gonna do, and then suddenly an hour or two hours or three hours has passed and you have been in this place where you have just been in the work. Nothing feels better than that, it's like a drug. That's wonderful. Um, and I guess that's what I write for, for that feeling of 
it, it's almost to me like magic. You know, something happens, and it's and, and you can't make it happen, but when it happens, it is such. You you feel like you've touched something true inside of yourself and brought something onto the page that would not have existed if that hadn't happened. And that, for me, is an amazing feeling. I can't think of a better place to end our conversation <laughs> with uh, Ruth Reichel. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Ruth Reichel. I want to. Um,